nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. In the process of publishing our tool, I mentioned once or twice that you get into a workspace and you use Subversion or you check out your code. Uh, I don't know if you guys have used Subversion or any source code control system yet, but let me explain to you how that works. All right, so first of all, what is this Subversion thing? Subversion is like a program called CVS, but it works a lot better. Um, CVS is the concurrent versioning system in Linux. Uh, if you're kind of older, you might have heard of it before or even used it. And I put that reference there because there are a lot of people that are like, oh, CVS, I know that. Um, it was created by some people at CollabNet a long time ago, a decade ago. Uh, it's been in production for a while, so it's pretty stable. It has an open source license, so you're free to use it. And a lot of people use it on Linux uh, especially, although it also works on Win32 and a bunch of other platforms. Um, and basically, it's a way of managing the source code that you create for your tool. So what you can do is take all the source code for your tool and upload it into Subversion, into what Subversion calls a repository, where it stores your code. And then you can check out or download your code anywhere else that you want to work on it. So it works with the client server model. In our case, the server is NanoHub. And then let's say this is your, your machine here in the lab. And maybe this is your laptop, which you use at home. So you can check out your code onto any computer, work on it, and send the changes back. You can go to a completely different computer and pull down the latest version of the code, work on it, and check in your changes. So that's what it's for. It's for keeping track of your source code. So here we are with some code. We're going to upload it into the repository. And then I can download and check it out onto a completely different client, like at home or something like that. So it, think of it as a way of storing your source code. Now, you guys may say, oh, that sounds cool and everything, but I don't need that. I've, a lot of people tell me, like, I don't need that. Um, and uh, it used to be that we would tell people, well, OK, but I think you're making a mistake. Now we just say, no, you're going to use Subversion, whether you like it or not. Because um, I'm, I'm tired of these problems. Uh, so imagine this. Imagine you have a version of a program that's all working, version X1 of your program. You spent a lot of time on it. You worked a little bit more. You've got X, version X2. You fixed a few bugs. You added a feature. And you took it over to a machine, and you installed it on some machine. Um, like nowadays, we used to have a machine called Hamlet, but nowadays there's Coates and Rossman, all these machines at Purdue, right? So you need to get your code onto that machine and kind of get it built and compiled. And as you're doing that, there's actually problems, but your make file is wrong or something. There's a bug in the code, or you forgot to declare something double. So oh yeah, you fix that over there on that machine to make it work on that machine. Uh, and then you take that code and you put it onto another machine, like at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, right? You copy the latest version there, and in the process, there's probably a problem there too. So OK, well, I'll fix the make file a little bit more, and now it works on everything, supposedly. Now. In the meantime, you've been working on some other stuff, and you copied the working version of your code to test. You kind of forgot about all the changes you made on Hamlet and NCSA, but you copied your latest code from your home machine to test, and you made some more changes. And you sent that code to email via email to someone, right? Because they said, hey, send me a copy of your code. So you're like, OK, here it is. And, and then they start making changes, and then they want to send you the changes back, right? And at this point, now, there's like five versions of the code floating around. And there's a problem. Because in the latest version, when I take this very latest code and I compare it to my version x2, it's almost right. It's just a little bit off, right? Like, instead of 3.125, I'm now getting 3.12498. That's probably good enough, isn't it? It's probably just rounding, isn't it? IEEE or something. Um, and and instead of uh, 9.987, I'm getting 9.9901. So now that's like only two significant figures now. On the third significant digit, it's starting to get dicey. But it's probably OK, right? Because I really want to be done and graduate, right? So like, ugh. you remember, with scientific code, there's a good chance that you just goofed up something small. And that this should not be different at all. Probably should not be different at all. You should at least be getting like six significant figures. Come on. Like, machines nowadays compute um, 
a, a dozen, 16 significant digits, right? So out of 16 significant fi digits, I think you can get at least three, right? So if you're seeing stuff like this, it's pretty scary. It probably means your code is poorly written or there's a bug somewhere. So the other thing that's interesting is that when you run this code, the original version took 420 seconds. The new version takes 340 seconds. Hmm, is it optimized? Did you optimize your code? Or did you forget to call a certain routine, right? Maybe somehow you're not calling a routine to generate the right model values, and that's why it runs a lot faster now, but it's also a whole lot less accurate, let's say. Well, of course, I don't know which is right. So stuff like this happens and it just drives you crazy. You have no idea which version of the code you should trust. Is this the version or is that the version? Which version is correct? And really the only way you can know for sure is by going back and running your Rapture Regression Tester or by checking values against the literature or by having someone else run the code and maybe double check everything for you. So there's, there's a lot of work there that needs to be done. All right. Now if I haven't scared you already into using Subversion, I hope I did, um, let me tell you another reason. Number one, if you're already using CVS, you should use Subversion instead, because it's better. You might be using Git, in which case Git might be the best of all uh, nowadays. So if you're using Git, I won't give you any argument on Linux. Um, but Subversion is a lot better than CVS because it uses secure transport and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so when you connect with Subversion to NanoHub, it uses HTTPS, sends your code over secure transport, and sends it into a repository. Uh, so it's stored somewhere else off your machine and backed up. Now that's really good because, like, remember the story a minute ago, you're like, where is that latest version of the code? I know I fixed the make file at some point. Like, where did I put that fix? You never have to guess with Subversion because you're going to commit all your changes and your commits will always be in the repository. They'll either be in the latest code or they'll be in the history somewhere. So if you're like, oh yeah, I remember I added that but then I deleted it and I wish I had that code again, you can go back into the repository and pull out an old version. You can see everything that's in there. Subversion does versioning of all your code. The other thing about Subversion is that it'll answer who broke the build. Now, I don't know if you guys have run into this. When you get into a team with like three people, you'll work like a dog over the weekend getting everything right. You come in Monday morning, you're ready to show it to your advisor. You show, you show up and it's broken all of a sudden. It's broken. Who broke it? It was working this morning. I had it working, right? And then you look in the history on Subversion and it shows you that after I checked in version six, this guy Clark's M checked in two more versions. But at least you can tell your advisor, hey, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was, it, was, it was this guy. He checked in the latest version. He broke it, right? So there's a history there. You can see, like, who did what and who's messing with my code. So, uh, so there's the detail. Now I can go and kick Steve Clark in the pants and say, what did you do? The last reason is, and this has happened to me more than once, imagine your hard drive just died. So you got right to the last second, you were just fixing the copyright lines, and all of a sudden you hear that clicking sound coming from the disc. It sounds like kind of a Geiger counter, you know? And, and you know when you're hearing that clicking sound that the, your disc is like toast at that point. You start thinking, maybe I can keep it running just long enough to pull off one last copy. No, no, if it's clicking, it's probably gone. But fortunately, you put your stuff in subversion and you've been committing all your changes. So if your disk dies, no big deal, you'll just pull out your laptop and you'll check everything out onto your laptop and you go from there. Or you walk in, you know, you go to the, the lab at, at Purdue and check out your code and go from there. So if your code is in subversion, it's always safe. You can always pull it down to whatever machine you want and uh, kind of continue on from there. Like that. I'm back in business now. Two minutes later, just set your laptop aside, worry about that later. Use that new laptop instead. You're all set to go. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about Subversion now. Maybe you're interested in using it. Um, if you were going to set up on your own Linux machine this afternoon, maybe you guys use Linux at, at home or whatever. If you wanted to use Subversion, this is what you would do if you were starting scratch. Um, you could make a directory. I'll call it initial or whatever. And inside that, you make three directories by convention. Um, you don't have to, but, but typically when people are using Subversion, they do this. They make three directories called trunk, branches, and tags. You'll find out why later. Trunk is the one for us that's important because that's where, that's the root of all of your changes. Um, and you might take all of your source code files 
all your star.cs or your tool.xml or whatever and move them into that trunk directory like that. So now I've got all these directories. I've got trunk, branches, and tags, and I've got all my files moved into the trunk, all ready to go. All right, now you can type these commands to create a repository. And if you're on your own Linux system, this is what you have to type. You have to type svn admin create blah, 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 some repository, and then svn import initial blah, blah, blah into that repository. So that'll take this, this directory structure that I just created and put it into a subversion repository. And you store that repository wherever you want. User local svn repo might be a good choice, but whatever you choose. So on an ordinary Linux system, that's what you would do. Now, we're not on an ordinary Linux system. We've already got NanoHub. We're all set to go. NanoHub simplifies a few of those steps and does all that stuff for you. So when we go through the contribution process and we fill out our form and we create a project, like I showed you a minute ago, NanoHub is going to automatically create a subversion repository for you. It will automatically create the trunk, the branches, and the tags, and it will automatically put a bunch of stuff in the trunk. It'll create a rapture directory for you. It'll create a middleware directory for you. It'll do all this stuff, like getting your tool all ready to go. So that much you don't have to worry about. All you have to do, once you've created a project on NanoHub, all you have to do is check out your code. Check out the initial code and add your stuff to it. So, you do something like this. In your workspace or in your home machine or whatever, wherever you are, you type a command svn checkout and you give it a path like this. HTTPS, remember it uses secure transport. So HTTPS colon slash slash nanohub.org slash tools slash and where it says your tool, you use your tool name. If you made a tool called Spyro, you say Spyro there. If you make a tool called QDOT, you say QDOT there. So whatever your tool name is, you put that in there. And then SVN for subversion and trunk, because that's where all the good stuff is. And then you make a, the same directory name, usually the same as your tool, uh, whatever your tool name is, Spyro or QDOT. So if you do that, what that does is it takes the code from NanoHub, downloads it to your local machine, and checks it out so you can work on it. So it takes that skeleton empty directory structure that NanoHub creates for your project, and brings it down to your machine. You can see it gives you a rapture directory, a doc directory, source directory, middleware, examples, all that stuff. And it tells you you're at version one. Okay, now you want to add some files because you've got some stuff now that you're going to add. So you can make dir example slash ex1 for example and you can edit a file called readme and add some stuff in there. So now I've got a directory and a file. And I can tell subversion to keep track of that, to use that. So I say svn add example slash ex1. And what that will do is add that directory and everything in it to my repository. So from now on, that's part of the repository. It's not just a weird file on my file system, a junk file. It's like part of my tool. So I do svn add now. And it's a good idea to go way back up to the top, to the very top of your tool, and then you can look at the status. If you do SVN status, it'll show you every, all the changes that you've made that are pending, that aren't quite solid yet, but think of them as proposed changes, right? So I've got examples ex1, examples ex1 readme. It says A next to it. A means add. And then there's a question mark next to A dot out. Um, the question mark next to A dot out says that uh, it doesn't know what that file is. Remember, a.out is probably what you get from the compiler. It's like some garbage file. I don't want to add that. I just want to add examples ex1 and examples ex1 readme. Those are the ones I want to add, right? So, so that, that looks correct to me. Some things you want to add, some things you don't. If I want to make that change permanent, I can type svn commit. When I say svn commit, it says, OK, I'm going to add ex1 and ex1 readme. I can, it'll usually pop up like VI or Emacs or whatever, and I can type in some commands. Uh, created the ex1 directory and added the readme file. And then as soon as I save that, it'll commit the change. And from now on, that's a permanent part of my tool. So when, I, when I'm done with svn commit, you'll see it saying adding, adding, and then it'll say it's committed revision 2. So now I have two versions of my tool. 
And if you look, you'll actually see it there too. Um, if you look in the change history, you'll see the original version was created by root, and then you'll see revision two created by me on such and such a date and all of that. What's checked in? All right. Now you guys might say, well, I don't use Linux. I, I use uh, Windows and all that. I like Windows. Well, that's fine because there's a version of uh, SVN called Tortoise SVN that you can use on Windows. And when you add this package to your Windows installation, you'll get a right menu click. You can right click on any folder and say SVN checkout. It'll add that option onto the menu, the right menu. And um, so and you can check out your code. You'll get a directory with a green check mark on it. That lets you know it's being controlled by subversion. And you can right click on that and you can do things like SVN update and SVN commit and all that kind of stuff. So there's an equivalent Windows way of doing all this stuff if you prefer Windows. When it asks you about committing, um, it'll give you dialog boxes. Instead of typing command line options, it'll prompt you with the dialog boxes for all this stuff. Uh, and then it'll show you basically the same stuff. It'll show you added all this stuff and then at revision two. And so, um, so it's all the same. It's the Windows version of it. All right. Now, that's adding. So you can add stuff in. What about moving and removing and changing things around? Suppose I get in here into my examples ex1 and people are complaining because I made that file called readme and the Windows users don't like it because it doesn't know what file type it is. So I want to change readme to readme.txt. Normally you just say mv move readme to readme.txt. With subversion you have to tell subversion about those changes. So we say svn move readme to readme.txt. That way subversion knows you're trying to rename the file. And what it will do is basically add a new readme.txt and delete the old readme file in the version history. So you can see it kind of echoing those commands back at you. I may go up a couple of levels in my project and I may say I don't need that doc directory. So I can say svn delete doc and it will delete. Again, I don't just remove that folder myself. I should tell svn to delete the directory. And it will delete the directory and then keep track of the fact that it needs to be deleted. All right, now if I say svn status, I can see what's pending. These are the pending changes. I can see the doc will be deleted when I commit, and then it's going to add readme.txt, and it's going to delete the old readme. So those are the changes that are coming up. Now, if I want to make those permanent, I can say svn commit, and it'll prompt me again. It'll show me what changes I'm about to make, and it'll prompt me, and I can type in my message, move some files around. Right? And then again, now I'm at revision 3, and you'll see on the change log, Revision 3, MMC, move some files around. So you can always keep track of who's making changes, and it's really a good idea to put those comments there, because when people commit stuff without comments, it's like, what did they do? I have no idea. I have to look at all the diffs now to figure out what they changed. I'd rather know conceptually what they're changing. You know, I changed this part, I changed that part, I added uh, notes to my Spyro, uh, whatever. And that way you kind of know, you can tell which version has what. All right. Now, all this gobbledygook over here, the D and the A and the plus and this and that, um, there's actually a, a link in the notes here that'll take you to the documentation. Um, there are a bunch of simple ones like the ones I'll show you, and then there are more complicated ones um, that you can find uh, that you only need once in a blue moon. Um, so I just kind of, I put in uh, just a, a pointer in the notes here. If you're curious, you can follow the link here where it says this page, and it'll pop up the, the doc. All right, now suppose you guys are all trained in using Subversion. You've committed some changes to the repository. Very good. And suppose I do a checkout now, and I check out the code to one machine, and I do a checkout now, and I check out the code to another machine. So I've got the code in a few different places now. That's good. Suppose I make a change to the make file. Over here, I'm editing the make file, and I'm going to make a small change for this machine. Instead of gcc-g, I want it optimized. So I'm going to say gcc-o to have it optimize the code. And then I'll commit that change back to the repository, right? So I've made a change. Now, when I'm working on the other machine, I may want to get those changes. So over here, I can say svn update, and it will bring down the latest version of that code. 
So it'll always bring you the latest, it'll bring you up to date on whatever machine you're on. You can say SVN update, it'll suck down the latest changes. So, my message to you is don't copy code around. You remember in the beginning where I said, well, you take that code and you copy it onto this machine, you change it, and you copy it onto this machine, you change it. Nah, 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 nah. Don't do that. Always put your code in subversion, always check out and commit, because then wherever you want the code, you just do an SVN checkout or update, and it'll always update to the latest version. It's a lot safer, a lot cleaner than copying code around, because you'll get really confused. If you're copying code around, you don't know which version of what and whether you had that fix or not, and it's all a mess. So don't copy code around. Instead, you move codes with SVN checkout, and you do things like SVN commit and SVN update to move the changes around. Trust me, it's worth it. It really is. Like, you're looking at me like you're so skeptical. Trust me, you're going to love it once you get used to it. All right. So suppose I uh, have modified a file. Um, if I do SVN status, I'm looking at my file, and it says source hello.c. And my gosh, sometimes I can only remember things for about a week at a time. You know, let's say, let's say uh, there was a bar mitzvah last week, and I just can't remember anything like before that in history. Uh, I, too many brain cells gone or something. So you can do SVN diff and it will show you what you were working on. Maybe it was a week ago, maybe it was six months ago. I'm thinking, why did I, what was I changing? SVN diff shows me that there's a diff here pending that I haven't committed yet. This is a, a change that I've made locally that I haven't yet committed. And I can remember, oh yeah, I remember. Um, I was changing the Hello World program. I got rid of the world, the fine, uh, the line that says Hello World. You see there's a minus next to it. And I added two lines that say, say hello to everyone and hello universe. So now that's what the difference is that's sitting on my local machine. And I can ask myself, do I want to commit that change or am I ready to go with that? Is that good or not? If I don't like the change, if I think, wow, what was I smoking? That was like crazy. I should never have done that. You can always do SVN revert and it will, it will move that file back a version, back to what it should be from the repository. So if you say SVN revert, it'll take changes that you've made locally but you haven't committed yet, and it will get rid of them. And it's almost like a reverse update. It's taking you back to the last safe version of the code. All right, you can also revert changes with directories and stuff too, by the way. If you delete a directory and then you decide, ooh, I shouldn't do that, you can actually revert as long as you haven't committed that change. All right, now, one last interesting thing. Suppose I'm over here on a machine and I'm editing the make file. Um, in the make file, I'm gonna add a clean target. I'm gonna add rm minus f start out o and a dot out. So I've, I've edited the make file. And over here, on this machine, I've edited the make file, or maybe my teammate, maybe it's someone else. Someone else working on the team checked out the code and they edited the make file too. Although they added cc equals gcc and dollar cc dash o hello dot c. Right? So we've both been working on the same make file. Whoever checks in first has got the easy job. So you always want to check in early, although not so early that you break the build because then someone like me comes after you and spanks you and says, why'd you break the build? But when you're happy with your changes, check them in. Because the sooner you check in, the fewer problems you have. So over on this side, I'll do an SVN commit, and my makefile changes get committed to the repository. Over on the other side, the other person, when they go to commit, they won't be able to. It'll tell them you're not up to date. There's something wrong. So on the other side, before you can commit, you're going to have to do an update. In the process of doing an update, it'll bring those changes down and it'll show me, okay, I have my changes, cc equals gcc and dollar cc, but it'll add in clean, the clean target. That's good, right? Because I made the change over there, it gets pulled over here, I did the merge, everything's good. So now that I've updated my code, then I'm okay. Then I can do svn commit, and now the make file looks like this with all of our changes in it. So it really helps you work together as a team, integrate changes, and get them all committed. All right. Now there can be problems. Suppose that I'm working on the make file over here, and not only did I add the clean target, but I added dash o hello. And at the same time, over here, 
my teammate added CC equals GCC and the dollar CC there. So we're both working on the make file at the same time, and at this point, we actually made a, we both made a change. These, this, each of these lines here, we both changed them. So again, I repeat, whoever checks in first has no problem. Check in early, check in often. Not so often you break the build, but often. So if you do SVN commit, that make file goes up no problem. The next guy, when he tries to do his commit, he won't be able to do it. He'll have to do SVN update. And when he does the SVN update, it'll suck the changes down and it will tell you, ooh, I always hate this when I see the C. Um, usually it tells you all the stuff that's updated. And when it shows you a C like that, it means there's a conflict in that file. So it means you're going to have to figure something out. It doesn't just merge neatly together. There's a problem. If you try to SVN commit, it'll tell you it failed. It won't let you do it. And it'll remind you that there's a problem. There's a conflict. You've got to fix it. Won't let you change it. All right. And if you look, SVN status will tell you, by the way, I've got some junky stuff sitting around. And then I've got this make file. Look at the junky stuff. The make file is in conflict. And subversion actually leaves around some different versions. It'll leave, leave around revision 5, revision 6, and something it calls makefile.mine. So makefile.mine is my version of the makefile before I started all this mess. And makefile right now has got the best guess of everything merged together. Subversion takes its best guess and tries to fit it all together. And then the revision 5 and re revision 6, I can look at those if I have questions about older versions. So now it's my job. I have to figure out which one of these is right or what, how to fix it. So the makefile is the best guess. That's usually the good starting point to start there. So if I look in that make file, here's what I see. It'll look like this. Subversion puts in the less than, less than, less than, dot mine, and then it shows you the line from your file, and then the equal, 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 and then the rest of the stuff from the other file, and then the greater than, greater than, greater than, dot r6. So it, what it's showing me when you see that less than, less than, equal, equal, greater, 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 that's an area where I have to figure out which is right. So I look, is it the top part that's right, or is it the bottom part that's right, or is it some combination? In this case, it's some combination of the two, right? Because the top part, mine, isn't quite right. The other guy added the dash O. Um, or, but at the same time, my, their part isn't quite right because I added the dollar CC. So we actually have to mix up, we have to make both of those changes, you know? I need to get, I need to get the CC here, but I also need the dash O hello. So this, line I have to fix to have both of those parts. So what I can do then is put it all together. In my editor, nothing fancy, just in the editor you delete the less than, less than, you delete the equals and the greater, greater, and you build everything all back together the way it really should be. So I, I put everything together onto one line with the dollar cc and the dash o oh, hello and put it all together and that's the way I want it. And so I save that file out and then I tell SVN that it's okay. It's cool now. Say SVN resolved make file. And SVN knows, okay, I'm blessing that. That make file is in good shape now. Don't do that unless you got rid of all those equal, 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 and less than, less than, or else you broke the build, right? Next time somebody tries to make, make's going to lose its mind because of all that less than, less than, less than, equal, 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 burp. And you'll be like, bah, who did that? Why didn't you fix the conflict? So go in, fix everything up, and then say SVN resolved. All right, and then... Once you've cleaned up all the conflicts, you can say SVN commit, and it will go ahead and commit. Now I've got everything all put back together, right? That's the hardest part of using SVN. When two people edit the same file at the same time and change the same line, then all of a sudden it's like you're stepping on each other's toes and you've got to work it out. Usually that doesn't happen, because usually we'll work on a project, I'll work on one file, you'll work on another file, or I'll work on one file, you'll work on the same file, but you do the top and I do the bottom or whatever. Usually the changes don't conflict, but when you actually both change the same line, Subversion's like, come on, are you kidding me? How do we fix it? So it's up to you to fix it. All right. There are a few other things that are kind of handy to know. If you want to get an old version of your tool, there's a flag there, dash R3. You can give a revision number. So if I say dash R3, it'll check out revision 3 of my code. Sometimes you say, ooh, I know back in revision 12 I had that cool thing, but I deleted it. So you can check out that revision and go back to the old version. You can also say, I wonder what the old makefile looked like. You can say SVN cat 
R5 make file, and it'll find that make file, find revision 5, and print it out to the screen. So that's a quick way, not checking out the whole revision, but just getting one file, getting an old version. You can save that too, by the way, onto a new file. Um, and, or in this case, I guess, overwrite your current file. You can also say SVN log, and SVN log will tell you like the revision history. So if I say SVN log make file, it'll tell me all the different revisions of that file, what's changed. You can also say SVN log, not for make file, but just in general. It'll tell you all the revisions about a particular repository. Um, current directory, I guess. All right. Now, Subversion has some pretty good defaults, usually does the right thing. If I take a JPEG and I copy it into my examples directory, and then if I say SVN add, you notice it says add and it says bin. It recognizes that that's a binary file. Um, so Subversion usually is pretty good about recognizing binary files, and that's good because it treats them differently. Binary files don't get merged the same way as ASCII files, right? Um, so the bin there doesn't it doesn't do any funny translation, carriage returns and line feeds, and it doesn't try to merge versions. So it's good to, for Subversion to know about binary files. When you commit it, you'll see it's a binary file again, adding bin j examples slash diagram.jpg. If for some reason you had a file called demo.dat and you know it's a binary file, and you add it, and if for some reason Subversion doesn't get it, like here it just says add, it doesn't say anything about bin binary file, you like, ding! You can fix it. Um, there's this, all this gobbledygook that you can say if you dig down into the subversion documentation. You can set a property, uh, you can do prop set and say it's octet stream on this file and you can change the EO line style and uh, all of that stuff. So if you need to, you can set these properties, but usually subversion does the right thing. I'm just mentioning that because it is, it is possible, not likely, but possible, excuse me, to put a binary file into a repository and then have it get corrupted. Because if, if Subversion thinks that it's an ASCII file, it's going to automatically convert carriage returns and line feeds and do merges and weird stuff. So with, a, with something like a JPEG or a MP4 video, that, that wreaks havoc on the whole thing. I mentioned way at the beginning about branches and tags, and I'll just mention quickly about that here. Um, you can think of the whole source code repository as a tree, and so far we've been dealing with the trunk, the trunk of the tree. The trunk is sort of the main line of where all the code is, and as time goes on, you get more and more revisions on the trunk. Now, at some point, you may say, well, I'm going to do something so crazy with my code, I don't want to mess up the rest of my team, I want to create a separate version of that, a kind of a different, they call it a branch. If you Think of it as copying your code to a different directory, and you can work on it separately where you don't mess anybody up. And then later on, maybe you'll merge it back into the main line after you've worked it all out. So they call that a branch. And you can create a branch in, um, uh, in Subversion by doing something like this. Um, you can do a checkout. And you notice, in this case, when I, when I did the checkout, I didn't say SVN trunk. I just said SVN. That'll check out the whole SVN directory, including the trunk and the branches and the tags and everything that we originally set up. So I can check that out into a directory, and I can go in there, and then I can say, I'll see the trunk and the branches and the tags and all that. I can say SVN copy that trunk directory to a new branch, branches McLennan. And that'll act as though I've created a, a complete brand new copy of everything, as if I picked up the whole directory and copied it. Now, it's more efficient than that. You might say, well, my gosh, I've got 10 megabytes of stuff, and I don't want it to copy 10 megabytes of stuff. Well, Subversion's really smart about that. All the files that haven't changed, it won't copy. But the ones that change, it keeps track of all the differences. So that's the other smart thing about Subversion. It's not just copying code. It actually keeps track of all the differences. It's very efficient. All right. And then I, once I've copied my trunk to a new branch, McLennan, then I can commit that. And that'll go ahead and create that private branch. And then I can check it out. And again, instead of saying SVN trunk, I can say SVN branches McLennan, and it'll take that directory and check it out into a different, whatever directory name I give it here. Instead of, I didn't want to confuse myself, so instead of just saying your tool, I said your tool all up there, and I said your tool MCL here, just to remind myself, that's a branch. Um, so, so that's basically how you do it. 
what I'm telling you is, it's really weird with Subversion, when you create branches and tags and things in Subversion, you just copy them as directories, and you just do it with Subversion. You do an SVN copy of one directory to another, and in this case, there's nothing special. We just started everything by saying we have a directory called trunk and branches and tags, and I can copy from one to the other. Um, so all I'm doing is copying directories, basically. And I can work on this whole copy of my tool all by myself, and I won't mess anybody up, and I can change everything and plumb the guts of everything, and I'll put it back later when it's all settled down. Now, similarly, I can copy the trunk to something called tags release 1.0. Tags is uh, typically a, a practice in computer science, software engineering, where you, you're just about to release your tool, you want to tag it. And if anybody ever asks you, hey, can you pull up version 1.0 again? You're like, oh my gosh, what's version 1.0? I don't know, it was somewhere back in July or something, right? Um, if you do this, if you do SVN copy the trunk to tags release 1.0, from now on, you'll have a copy of that just as it was in version 1.0. And that's really good too, by the way, because you can go on and make changes and change your tool and now maybe I'm at release 10 and then someone will say, hey, I found a bug in release 1.0. And well, normally you'd say, just get the latest release, right? But if you wanted to fix 1.0, if you were in a company, let's say, and the company actually has paying customers and the paying customers say, I want 1.0 fixed, you can go back to this tagged version and you can fix files in that release and then put out a new release of 1.0, 1.0.1, or whatever. So it's a really great idea when you're about to release a tool to do a copy like this, to tag it. You can think of that as if you're applying a tag onto the tree. And from then on, when I want to see exactly what was in release 1.0, I can just check out tag slash release 1.0, and I'll get everything checked out. Um, we, I have a comment in here. When you do this branching stuff, if you have many people on your team creating branches and all that kind of thing, and then later on you want to take a branch and merge it back in, it's, it's a really a big pain. And the comment here says to use SVK. I, I would say nowadays don't use subversion. If you're going to do weird, complicated merging and branching, don't use SVN or SVK at all. Use Git. There's a new thing nowadays that people use called Git, which is probably far superior to this. It's a little more complicated. If you already know Git, stick with it. If you don't know Git, Subversion's a little easier. It might be easier for you to get started. So we still have people using Subversion in NanoHub, um, and it works well for small projects. But all this branching and, well, the tagging's pretty simple, but the branching stuff, if you start doing a lot of branches, you're not going to like Subversion anymore. All right, one last thing. Uh, mention that there's a lot of good pointers out there. There's O'Reilly books on Subversion. You can find the O'Reilly books on the web. You can, a lot of documentation online. Um, and uh, all the stuff, uh, if you want to check out Tortoise SVN and all the different uh, flavors for Windows and all that. So you, you can find all that stuff online. And one last thing I wanted you guys to try before we head out today um, is using Subversion for your development teams. I hope you guys still remember your team. If not, I guess you can look in the wiki, find your name, because you put your name in the wiki, right? Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to, to get into a workspace and I want you to check out the code for your development team. And I want you to, actually you can check out the whole code, I suppose, um, but I want you to check out the code for your development team, go into the directory for your, your development team, add your name onto the list and then commit it. And again, whoever checks in first has the easy job because everybody after that has to deal with all the merge conflicts, right? So. If we go back to our boot camp, you remember we were working in, where was it? Slash tools, slash boot camp. Oh, slash wiki. I have to do that. All right. So here's our wiki page, right? Um, and here's lab assignment number. 12, right on the wiki page. Instructions are right in the wiki. So you can start up a workspace and use Subversion to check out the source code. And it says, follow these instructions. And there you go. Every project on NanoHub has a little briefing on Subversion. So if you're ever wondering, how do I check out the code for this project, there are always instructions on the project. And they actually show you the SVN checkout command. 
You see right here, there's, there's a command here that says SVN checkout, and it tells you exactly what to type. HTTPS, nanohub.org, tools, bootcamp, SVN trunk, bootcamp. That's what I want you to do. Get into your workspace and check out the code. Then I want you to find your directory, dev team one, dev team two, and I want you to go in there and edit the stuff. We good back there? All right. All right, so here's my solution to the lab assignment. I wanted you guys to get into the boot camp problem uh, project and check out the code and make some changes. So, oops, in my workspace, I'm going to get in my workspace here, and I'm going to do SVN checkout HTTP colon or HTTPS colon slash slash nanohub.org tools boot camp. And if you're wondering, dang, I wonder, what, what was that path again? I can't remember. Um, on every project, there's always instructions about how to do the uh, subversion checkout. And in this particular project, we linked it right here. We said, check out the source code for this project and follow these instructions. And this shows you the SVN checkout path here. So it's tools, bootcamp, SVN trunk, and I want to check it out to my old directory. So tools, bootcamp, SVN trunk, and I'm going to check it out to my own, I'll call it BC 2012. You can call it whatever you want. Whatever directory name you want to call it at the end. So that does the checkout, and it tells me that I'm at version 180. And if you watch, you'll just see this counter go up and up. As you guys are committing things, everybody's checking things in, the revision count keeps going up and up and up. So I'm going to go into bootcamp 2012, into dev team 1, and take a look, there's a readme, and, ah, oh, look, my name is there. Uh, terrific, I'll remove it for posterity. All right, so now i fixed it. If I do SVN status, it shows me I've modified that. If I go up a couple of levels and look around at all the files, I can look at SVN status over the whole thing. I can actually edit more than one at a time. Let me um, edit uh, dev team uh, three, too. Whoops, the readme file. Um, and I like this, but I'm going to get rid of all the blank lines and squoosh it all together. Somebody out there has put a lot of time in putting the blank lines in. They're probably mad at me, but anyway. So now if I do SVN status, it shows me I've modified both of those files. And I can always look at the diffs. I can say SVN diff dev team one readme, and it'll show me all the changes I've made. And if I want to back out, I can revert that file. SVN revert, dev team one, read me. And then put it back the way it is. Now if I look at all the changes, I didn't change that file anymore. And if I look at dev team one, read me, it's the old one with my name there. So at some point I've checked everything out. I've got it the way I want it. I do maybe one last update to make sure I'm up to date. Good. Now I do SVN commit. And it'll prompt me, it'll show me all the things I've changed and I'm about to commit, and I can add my comment, um, which is removed extra blank lines. And there you go. Now, sometimes you get to that point and you find out, uh-oh, had a conflict, somebody else checked something in in the meantime while I was messing around, and then you got to go and resolve the conflict. Um, so then you go and you, you do your update, you update your code, um, SVN update, you get the latest code, you edit the file, you get rid of all the conflicting files, you tell SVN you've resolved the conflict, and then you commit. That's all there is to it. I know you guys kind of worked through some of that too. Um, so if you get in the habit of using this SVN, it'll really help you out. We hit the worst case today because all you guys were editing the same file in the same spot at the same time. You were hitting tons of conflicts, which is why we do the lab assignment, which is good. Um, in real life, you won't hit conflicts that often because not everybody will be editing the same file in the same time. 
Uh, but it's a really great way of helping you merge the changes, work together in small teams. You may find yourself working with two or three other students this summer, working on a tool. You can check out the code. You can all work on it together, get it committed, and get it published on NanoHub.